for now. We have a second talk, uh, first submission for today, which is uh, Javad Darvish. Are you here? Javad? Hi. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Do you have my voice? Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. So uh, now we have a first uh, look in English for today is uh, Javad Darvish uh, with the uh, Divine Action and the Laws of Nature. Welcome. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Javad Darvish, uh, a postdoctoral researcher uh, in Sharif University. Uh, I am from Iran and I got my PhD last year uh, in the field of philosophy of science, uh, but generally uh, I'm focused on the relationship between science and religion. Uh, in my PhD and uh, in uh, my uh, postdoctoral research period. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much to invite me to the uh, conference. And uh, my topic is divine action and laws of nature with the subtitle of inexplicability of consistency in universal view versus the inexplicability of inconsistency in the dispositional view. Uh, generally, I try to examine the relationship between God's action with laws of nature, focusing on two types of uh, uh, view in laws of nature. First, universal view, and then the dispositional view. Uh, so first, uh, I uh, try to clarify the problem of divine action in nature and then uh, say something about uh, the laws of nature. And then at the third step, uh, 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 try to explain uh, the incompatibility or inexplicability of uh, the universal view with the laws of nature. And uh, finally, uh, argue uh, in favor of inexplicab inexplicability of inconsistency in this positional view. Uh, in divine action, uh, we are faced with uh, the difference question. In many articles and books, uh, you can find just answer to one of these questions, but uh, maybe the author uh, claimed that uh, solve the problem of divine action totally. But I uh, try to clarify this question. First, how could it be possible that the supernatural being influences, uh, influences a natural being? Second, where exactly is the room for divine action? Third, is the concept of God of the gaps scientifically and theologically con convincing? Fourth, what is the relationship between God and nature? It's a very general question. And finally, the fifth question is, what is the relationship between God's action and laws of nature? Which is this uh, uh, last question uh, we are trying to answer today. Uh, there is a famous separation uh, in the literature of divine action uh, between general divine action and the special divine action. General divine action uh, uh, defined as those action, actions of God that pertain to the whole of creation, usually and simultaneously. These include actions such as the initial creation and the maintenance of scientific regularity and the laws of nature by God. And the special divine action is defined as those actions of God that pertain the particular time and place in creation as distinct from another. This is a broad category and includes a traditional understand understanding of miracles. The notion of particular providence, God's personal actions, and some forms of religious experience. Uh, in the right side, you can uh, uh, see some instances, some example of a special divine action, prayer, prayer, miracles, providence, and inspiration. It's very important to uh, know that we 
uh, students reduce special divine action just to the miracle. Uh, I avoid uh, uh, saying something about miracles or providence because these concepts are about uh, religious studies. But I'm um, here in the place of the theology. And so I use a special, the, the, the concept of a special divine action rather than miracle or providence, and etc. Uh, what is the problem of divine action in nature? Uh, maybe the first philosopher uh, focus on this problem is David Hume in his book, An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. Uh, Hume uh, argued that the narration of miracles are weak, but the probability that the laws of nature being correct is high. Uh, so it's it's uh, in the uh, view of David Hume, it's uh, rational to accept the uh, laws of nature uh, and uh, refuse uh, accepting the occurring of the miracles. Uh, recent in uh, the recent uh, philosophers, uh, we can uh, uh, refer to Anthony Flew. Uh, he emphasized on the necessity of repeating experiments to establish that some physical effect uh, actually take place. So, uh, special divine actions are non-repeatable contents. Uh, are non-repeatable counter-instances counter to the laws of nature. It is a very important uh, term uh, that we, returned, uh, uh, we, we will return to this term, I mean the repeatability. It is a criteria that uh, separate, that different, differentiate between the laws of nature and the special divine action. A special divine action is non-repeatable phenomena, but uh, laws of nature are, uh, should meet this criteria that it, uh, it is repeatable. What is the laws of nature? A very uh, simple uh, uh, definition for the laws of nature is the statements that meet these three conditions. First, truthfulness, universality, and contingency. For example, when you say water boils at, at 100 centigrade, it can be a laws of nature because this statement meets these three conditions. But when we, uh, you say that sum, sum of angles of triangle is equal to uh, 180 degree, it is not uh, the statement that you can, you say it uh, as laws of nature because uh, it is true, uh, but it's true and it's correct uh, is not uh, physically. It is logically true. Uh, so it cannot meet the contingency condition of above uh, criteria. Uh, so at, at the left, at the right side, uh, I draw a shape, a very, very simple shape of uh, a, a different opinion uh, in the laws of nature. Uh, then uh, the first uh, separation is about the existence independently or existent uh, dependently. Uh, I mean, some philosophers uh, argue that laws of nature are subjective issue. Uh, they are in, in instrumentalist or anti-realist. Uh, view about laws of nature, and others uh, argue about they are independently exist in external world. They are realistic uh, about laws of nature. In this uh, uh, concept, uh, there are two categories. One, uh, uh, accept that the laws of nature are necessary, and the others uh, don't accept it's necessary. Regularity's theory of David Hume uh, is uh, don't not necessary view. Uh, 
And in the necessary, necessitarianist view, we have two concepts, we have two uh, approach to the laws of nature. First is the physical necessity uh, that is universalist, that is called universalist, and the other is metaphysical necessity uh, that is called dispositionalist view or uh, essentialist view. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I return to the uh, this. Uh, we are focused on this two last uh, uh, view because the main import, the main problem with the divine action is here uh, in the instrumentalist view or regularities view. We don't have a. A uh, hard problem. The hard problem of divine action, I uh, I think, is uh, with the uh, uh, necessitarianist or with deterministic view about nature or about laws of nature. What is universal view of the laws of nature? Uh, here you can see uh, David Armstrong, uh, one of the most important metaphysicians and a philosopher of science, uh, he said that uh, sometimes we have uh, some statement that meet the, the, uh, all of the three previous um, uh, conditions uh, that I mentioned, but they are, you can't uh, count them as the laws of nature. For example, you can see, uh, see these two uh, examples of, of David Armstrong. Uh, he says, all gold spur are less than a mile in diameter. And the second, all uh, uranium spurs are less than a mile in diameter. He argued that why the second one, second um, statement is uh, laws of nature, the first one is not laws of nature because maybe uh, we are not, uh, uh, have, we haven't uh, uh, a gold sphere that uh, its, di its diameter is of uh, one mile. But uh, you can suppose, you can presume that in the future, maybe a very rich man. Uh, uh, build this uh, gold spheres, but the second one is uh, it's impossible. It's physically impossible because of the structure, molecular structure of the uranium. So uh, the second one has the condition. David Armstrong called it uh, physical necessity that the first one doesn't have this. Uh, condition doesn't have this uh, feature. So law is the necessary relation between universal in this view, in the view of David Armstrong. For example, if you have two universal, first is the Fness, uh, which can you suppose being copper, and the second one is genus that being a conductor of electricity. Then you have this relationship that N, N is the law, natural law or uh, laws of nature. Uh, the law between necessary law between F and G is that if you have any thing that uh, being under the Fness, uh, it, it, it is meets the criteria of genus. Uh, it is the relationship, it is a necessary relationship uh, that David Armstrong uh, uh, called it universal view that is physic physically necessary. Uh, my claim here is that the consistency of a special divine action with laws of nature in universal view is inexplic inexplicable. Uh, because we have a very important distinction between categorical properties and dispositional properties. It is uh, uh, one of the uh, main topic of uh, analytic uh, metaphysics, analytic uh, contemporary analytic metaphysics. Uh, 
uh, for example, if you have a, a salt crystal, uh, its categorical properties is it's white and solid, but its dispositional properties, it's soluble in water. Uh, so you can understand that the categorical properties are the fixed and actual property, but the dispositional property are soluble, are the uh, uh, potential property. And the main issue here is that uh, in the universal view, in the view of the David Armstrong, the fundamental properties of the natural kind are categorical properties, not dispositional properties. So I can uh, draw this uh, argument. First, laws of nature is equal with laws of science. It's uh, the main uh, or the main uh, claim, the, my my main claim, uh, that is uh, that it can be proven, that it can be explained by the previous distinction. Laws of nature is equal with laws of science because scientists just see the actual uh, behavior uh, and the categorical properties. And laws of nature in the universal view, uh, like the scientists, uh, just consider the uh, actual property and um, the fixed and uh, actual property. Uh, second statement, my second uh, statement in, in this argument is laws of science has the property of repeatability. Third, a special divine action doesn't have the property of repeatability. Four, a special divine action is not compatible with the laws of science. So, a special divine action is not compatible with laws of nature if we adopt universal view. Uh, what is the dispositional view of laws of nature? Uh, I don't have time. Yes. I, OK. Uh, the dispositional, uh, dispositionalist view or essentialist view is based on two main principles. First, the fundamental property of natural con are their dispositional property, contrary to David Armstrong or universal view. And the second relationship between natural kind are rooted in their disposition and their essence. Uh, so the law, laws of nature is defined as the law supervene on the necessary relationship emerging from the actualization of dispositional properties. And we have this, uh, this conditional analysis, this relationship, uh, we have three main concepts in this view. First is D, that is dispositional property. Second is S, that is a stimulus or condition. And the third one is manifestation, M. For example, when you have the, something that has a, a elasticity, like the tire of the car, for example, uh, the, the, its dispositional property is elasticity. If it is being under the pressure or tension, then it has the manifestation of a stretch without deformation. This relationship is CA, uh, is the necessary relationship, and laws of nature supervene on this necessary relationship. The important issue is that uh, necessity of this law is metaphysical, not physical. In the view of Universal and David Armstrong, the necessity is the physical uh, issue, physical term. But here it is metaphysical view because it is true in every possible word, not just this actual word. And the second one is it is epistemologically a posteriori. Uh, because you can just see the uh, actual behavior, but you should uh, know that this actual property is uh, it is about it's related to the dispositional property that is manifest 
in uh, some kind of uh, stimulus or some kind of condition. Since the laws are metaphysically necessary and unbreakable, it seems that there is no room for a special divine action. It is the claim of the many of the uh, opponents of uh, dispositionalists, but I argue against it. We cannot show the incompatibility. My claim here is that if we hold the dispositional view of laws of nature, it is impossible to explain the incompatibility between the special divine action and the laws of nature. Why? Because uh, in my opinion, to prove the incompatibility of uh, to incompatibility, we should be able to show that the object O has property A, but God has created property B for A. For example, if O is fire and it has the property of burning, uh, maybe God creates the new property that is it, uh, it caused cool, it, it is cooling. Uh, then you can say uh, about that God uh, creates the, the, this property, this new property, by violating the laws of nature or by breaking the laws of nature, that you can uh, know everything about O, oh, everything about fire. I mean, if we can show that O does not have the dispositional property of B, then we can say that God has created B by breaking the laws. Is it true to say water boils in 100 centigrade? Uh, my answer is no, because at the sea level, water boils at 100 centigrade, but on the top of Mount Everest, water boils at 68 degree of centigrade. So it is important that only if we are aware of the actual form of O, we can assert that God created the property of B by breaking the laws of nature. Uh, in, in the, in the uh, example uh, of water, you can see that uh, if we don't know about the behavior of the water on the mountain, then uh, maybe we uh, attributed this phenomena for as a miracle. Uh, maybe for the people don't uh, know that the pressure uh, impact influence on the boiling point, they assume it as, as the miracle. Uh, but then they know in different condition, uh, water, uh, show different behavior, different uh, manifestation. Uh, they know it, it, it's it's very uh, real and it's it's not about uh, uh, miracles. Uh, so all actual form of O manifest under the infinite condition, and we don't know uh, the condition. Uh, I mean for, for all. All actual form of O manifest under the infinite condition. I mean that uh, there are inf infinite conditions uh, like uh, top of the mountain, like the deep uh, depths uh, layer on the mount mountain, like the conditions on the other planets. They are infinite condition, and we don't have access to infinite condition because some of which inaccessible, actually, and some of in principle, they are inaccessible for us. In summary, uh, if we show that O does not have this positional property of B, then we can say that God has created B by breaking the laws. For position one, uh, requires that we know all of O's dispositional properties. Since the epistemic way of attaining the dispositional property of O is a posteriori, we must have seen all the actualized form of O. Different actualized forms occur under different conditions and different stimuli. So to have all the actual form, we must have all the conditions and a stimuli. This uh, uh, conditions and stimuli are infinite. Uh, 
and we are unable to access all these conditions. Therefore, we can never know all the dispositional property of O. So we can never prove that O does not have property B. My conclusion is there can be a conflict between the special divine action and uh, an actualized property of O. But this is not the case for dispositional properties. That is, based on the universal view, the conflict between a special divine action and laws of nature can be shown, but based on the dispositional view, it can't be explained. Thank you very much. And sorry for... Uh, no problems with that. Thank you very much. So there are questions. I can see a question. I've read a question already, like uh, Samara Raujo. I feel too much similarities with the theory of elemorphism in Aristotle, uh, potentiality and anxiety from uh, Schick's matter, included disposition to change. Any thought on this? You can see it in the, uh, the chat. You can read it in the chat. Okay. Uh, can you <laughs> explain this question? Can you read this question in English? Ah, it's in, uh, it's in the chat. Oh, Samara? Samara? Uh, one moment. You right have... it down. Uh, sorry. Um, no, it's because I feel too much similarity with the lemorphism in Aristotle. And when you talk about post potentiality and actuality and you know, this is a theory of elemorphism and dispositions to change. And I see this, I saw this in Aristotle, and that's I only talk to you about if you know this, and I don't know. <laughs> that's it. Thank you to to show us your work and it's amazing. Thank, okay. you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, you're totally correct. It, uh, it is rooted in the Aristotle and um, they name uh, uh, themselves as New Aristotle, New Aristotelian uh, view. Yeah, it's completely correct. There's also some work uh, on this done by Anna Marmodoro. I mean, there is uh, on neotomistic uh, metaphysics and philosophy of science, which is pretty interesting that one day I would like to study, but it's highly complicated. So thank you. Uh, Agnaldo, there is a question from Professor Portugal. So uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question is uh, the following. Um, uh, if you take laws of nature as part of an explanation of a scientific explanation of a phenomenon, like in the uh, um, Carl Hempel's model, uh, you have the initial conditions and the laws of nature, and then from that you deduce or probabilistically draw the conclusion, which is the phenomenon you want to explain. In that case, um, do you think uh, the laws of nature could be taken as a kind of anchor for the explanation? It's, it's the um, unmovable part of explanation because initial conditions are changeable. But um, do you uh, is that the unmovable part, the unmovable character of the laws of nature that would be incompatible with the existence of God? Because if you, if that's so, why uh, we need to take this uh, um, as a metaphysical character instead of a epistemological um, uh, feature of the laws of nature. Um, Why don't you we mean just keep the, the epistemic element of uh, explanation instead of the metaphysical uh, idea that laws of nature are un unmutable. Uh, you mean that if we 
limits us to the epistemologic uh, claim about laws of nature is enough to uh, explain nature and it's not uh, we don't need to have the metaphysical view right yeah um, right it's it's correct and I think it's the it's related to the I think uh, debates in naturalist in methodological naturalist and metaphysical naturalist and meta methodological naturalist uh, say that uh, their view may be th their view is uh, silent about uh, existence of God, but metaphysical naturalists uh, um, say that there is no God. And I think uh, scientists are focused on uh, methodological naturali naturalism uh, and um, they can't uh, say about the existence of God or um, something like it. But I think it, 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 uh, the meta methodological naturalism uh, is related to the divine action because the um, divine action in nature is about the supernatural cause uh, and met methodological naturalism uh, uh, stated that uh, uh, because of the notion, uh, the term of causal closure, uh, we don't have any uh, physical phenomena that has a supernatural cause. So I think uh, methodological naturalism uh, is incompatible uh, with uh, divine action in nature, but it's not incompatible with the existence of God. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Great. Okay, any other questions? So, okay. Thanks again, Javad, for. Thank you very much. Interesting talk. And, okay.